Um, today's webinar will build on um, some of the topics that we've talked about in this series before. Understanding criminal actors, understanding key markets that are involved in transnational organized crime, and understanding vulnerabilities of African states to crime. Today, we start talking about resilience. So we will build on topics we considered in the past, look at some of the factors that shape how resilient African states end up being to transnational organized crime. The Organized Crime Index for Africa of the ENACT project, uh, an open source of data that we explained in earlier webinars, highlights 12 different factors that are important for resilience in many African states. We will examine three of those factors today. International cooperation, national laws and policies, and political leadership and governance. Parce que nous avons un intervenant qui est francophone, je vais... Because we have a speaker who is French speaking, I am going to speak in French. I am going to talk a little bit in French to you. We hope that at the end of this webinar, you discussed uh, because, uh, uh, I mean, the, the reasons why uh, political leadership, um, uh, why um, it, the rules are important, and also that you found solutions to the challenges uh, so uh, that you can have a good functioning uh, of your institutions. I am very happy uh, to have these experts here. They have lots of experience and they are going to exchange with us uh, with regards to these points. You have uh, their bio on this, the website and I really I only I will only read a few of uh, their points now but you can read the whole bios on their website. First, Ms. Dia Beeson Doyle is a UK qualified barrister and currently holds the post of Principal State Counsel at the Attorney General's Office in Mauritius, where she undertakes civil litigation, advisory and legislative drafting work for government ministries, departments and parastatal bodies in various areas of law, including rule of law, international law and maritime law. Previously, she was a prosecution lawyer under the supervision of the, direct, the Director of Public Prosecutions of Mauritius. Um, and she has also been a senior district magistrate in Mauritius. Next. Madame Goje Maimouna Gazibo, a ancienne directrice générale de l'Agence Nationale de Lutte contre la Traite des Personnes, she is uh, the former director of uh, the National Agency Against the Trafficking of Humans and Illegal uh, Transport of Migrants, ANLTPTIM. She is also a magistrate uh, to facilitate um, to uh, uh, courses on illicit trafficking of migrants and uh, persons. She also is responsible for uh, laws and uh, decrees. Um, and she worked a lot uh, on fighting illegal uh, traffic. She has also edited um, the law. She is a former uh, judge and she works at the Superior Court of Niami. All right, with that, we will enter into the presentations. We'll start with Ms. Dia Beeson Doyle. Dia, um, could I ask you first to speak about this? How can African security and justice actors use international conventions and domestic legislation as rule of law tools to build their country's resilience to transnational organized crime. We'll give you about seven minutes to talk about that, please. Thank you very much, Catherine, for this introduction. And I'm honored and delighted to be speaking in today's webinar. Transnational organized crime, by its very nature, involves activities which span more than one state's jurisdiction. Differences in legal system, legal tradition, language barriers, competing jurisdictions, problems in determining the jurisdiction over crimes, as well as lack of capacity or will to cooperate, 
all of these factors constitute real challenges for states. On the other hand, organized criminal groups know how to take advantage of these challenges and keep looking for safe havens for their criminal activities to thrive. As organized criminal networks span the globe, efforts to combat them must likewise cross borders in order to ensure that organized crime networks do not simply divert the activities to countries or regions where weak cooperation means weak criminal justice responses. Therefore, transnational organized crime requires a coordinated transnational response. All of this explains why international cooperation, no matter how challenging it can be, remains critical and why it is important for every state to speak the same language. And one of the most effective ways for countries to achieve international cooperation in the fight against transnational organized crime is through adherence to international conventions. Now, for those who are not lawyers in this group, I'm just going to give a brief synopsis of how international conventions work. An international convention is an agreement between different countries containing policies and principles which those countries agree to adhere to. Signature of an international convention does not make it legally binding. It merely indicates support of a country for the principles of the convention and the country's intention to ratify it. An international convention becomes legally binding upon a contracting state ratifying it. And the process of ratification of an international convention depends on the legal tradition of, on, of the state in question. For example, in states which are monist systems, international law does not need to be translated into national law. So the act of ratifying the convention immediately incorporates the, the international law into national law. On the other hand, however, for states with a dualist system, international law cannot be directly applied domestically. It has got to firstly be translated into national legislation before it can then be applied by the national courts. The United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, also known as the Palermo Convention, is the main international instrument in the fight against transnational organized crime. It was adopted in November 2000 and it entered into force in September 2003. That convention signifies a recognition by member states of the seriousness of the problems posed by transnational organized crime, as well as the need to foster and enhance close international cooperation in order to tackle those problems. States which go on to ratify that instrument commit themselves to taking a series of measures against transnational organized crime, including the creation of domestic criminal offenses, the adoption of new frameworks for law enforcement, cooperation, extradition, mutual legal assistance, transfer of sentence prisoners, and promotion of training and technical assistance for building or upgrading the necessary capacity of national authorities. The importance and impact of the Palermo Convention can best, in my view, be summed up in the words of former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, who had this to say, and I quote, with the signing of the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime in Palermo, Italy in December 2000, the international community demonstrated the political will to answer a global challenge with a global response. If crime crosses borders, so must law enforcement. If the rule of law is undermined, not only in one country, but in many, then those who defend it cannot limit themselves to purely national means." Unquote. The Palermo Convention has been supplemented by three further protocols, which target specific areas and manifestations of organized crime, namely trafficking in person, smuggling of migrants, and manufacturing and trafficking of firearms. Countries which have the real determination to fight transnational organized crime must, in my view, consider adhering not only to the convention, but also to these three protocols. For a country to meaningfully tackle in transnational organized crime, one of the most fun fundamental steps is for it to have the necessary legal framework in place. A legal framework not only sets the parameters to regulate criminal conduct, but it also gives law enforcement agencies the legitimacy to take action. And taking steps to put a legal framework in place shows that state's commitment and determination to fight transnational organized crime on the ground. Now, coming to your question about, is it sufficient to have domestic legislation in place? Can we have the same domestic legislation applying in, say, 10, 20, 30 years' time? Transnational organized crime is dynamic in nature. 
So we have criminal activities becoming more and more sophisticated, more and more complex, such that our laws have got to constantly evolve to adapt to changing reality and trends. Therefore, every state has a responsibility to ensure that their laws are constantly reviewed and if required, amended to be in line, not only with international trends, but also with evolving judicial decisions and also to respond to local needs. In the same vein, Catherine, harmonization of laws is also key in fostering better international cooperation to counter transnational organized crime. For example, neighboring countries in a region of Africa, they may want to collaborate to tackle a form of transnational organized crime prevalent in that region, for instance, piracy or drug trafficking. However, if those countries, if their laws differ regarding criminal offenses or the procedure which applies when dealing with international criminals, practical problems will arise when it comes to the gathering of evidence, prosecution or uh, investigation. Therefore, those countries wishing to collaborate amongst themselves must ensure that their procedures and legislation are aligned so that cooperation can become easier and faster. I hope this answers your first question. It does. Thank you very much, Dia, for um, covering a lot of ground in just a few minutes. Um, I know that there's so much more there that um, we could talk about in greater detail, but let me ask you a second question. Um, in the implementation of national legislation and international conventions to counter transnational organi organized crime, are there steps that African security and justice officials can be taking to minimize gaps between the de jure legal commitments that their countries may have made and the de facto strategy and policy imp implementation that that requires? I want to answer that question by referring to the Enact Organized Crime Index for Africa 2019, because one of the key findings it makes is that regardless of current levels of criminality, geographic diversity, economics or governance equality, African countries display very low levels of resilience to threat. And the report highlights that whilst great investment has been made in building up the architecture to respond to organized crime, such as national policies in place, legal framework, acceding to conventions, which does show some kind of political will. However, weak implementation in undermines country resilience. And the report goes on to state that indicators in the legal arena score high in the continental averages. For example, I think international cooperation is stated as scoring 4.49, national policies and laws is given 4.81. So across the continent, countries have been identified to have some degree of structures, policies, legislation or processes in place, but the problem remains implementation on the ground. So legal measures in place have served as a first step towards implementing action against organized crime, but in many ways it is easier to develop such frameworks than to implement them. And here we have to ask ourselves two questions in my view. Firstly, why are there gaps between legal commitments that we have made that exist on paper and actual implementation? And secondly, what can we do to minimize those gaps? Now, there are multiple reasons, Catherine, for poor implementation of international regional conventions or national legislation. I will cover the main ones. The principal one for me, in my view, is a lack of or a change in political will. You can have one government today that has the will and intention to combat transnational organized crime. The government signs and ratifies a relevant international uh, convention. The government goes ahead to enact domestic legislation. However, in the meantime, there's a next government that comes in, which perhaps lacks that same level of political will, or it may not view that objective as being a priority. And for me, this is the toughest problem to address because political will, as you know, does not lie in the hands of security and justice officials. So how then do we ensure that political will not only remains, but it is strengthened? In my view, different people have an important role to play. Security and justice officials have got to ensure that they continue to bring challenges to the attention of policymakers, and they must continue in their role of recommending appropriate, appropriate action being taken on the ground. Parliamentarians also have a duty. They have to perform their scrutiny duties in the National Assembly. They have to question government ministers as regards implementation. 
And also regional and international bodies have got to remind states constantly of their obligations and ensure in discussions that uh, implementation is discussed. Another reason for poor implementation could be the fact that a country has no rule of law system in place. Now, in a country where there is no rule of law, it is not possible to ensure implementation of national laws. That is why countries have got to ensure that there are inbuilt structures in them to ensure adherence to the principles such as supremacy of the law, separation of powers, equality before the law, accountability to the law, fairness in the application of the law, participation in decision making, legal certainty, procedural and legal transparency. And for the rule of law to operate, if I may say, it is very important to have robust and independent institutions in place. A third reason, Catherine, could be the lack of trained personnel or poor capacity building. Now, dealing with transnational organized crime requires specialist set of skills and knowledge. Law enforcement officers, investigators, prosecutors, judicial officers, all of them need to be sufficiently and frequently trained in relation to transnational organized crime. It is very important for states to continue allocating adequate funds for capacity building in their annual budget. Another reason for poor implementation is poor investigation. Poor investigation can be due to procedural hurdles. For example, there can be difficulties in gathering evidence from abroad due to there being no mutual legal assistance framework in place to allow cooperation between states. Mutual legal assistance in criminal matters is a process by which states seek for and provide assistance to other states in servicing of judicial document and gathering evidence for use in criminal cases. And the Palomo Convention, Article 18 of that convention, sets out in detail the procedure for mutual legal assistance. It calls for states to afford one another the widest measure of mutual legal assistance in investigation, in prosecution, in judicial proceedings. It provides for mutual legal assistance in, in a number of ways, in a number of stages, in the taking of evidence or statements, in effecting service, in executing searches and seizures, in examination on site, the provision of information, identifying proceeds of crime, even facilitating the appearance of witnesses, and any other type of assistance which is not barred by domestic law. Therefore, Catherine, countries are encouraged in the uh, Palermo Convention to resort to mutual legal assistance with other states to ensure successful investigations and, and, and from there on uh, to make sure that the process goes on to a successful uh, prosecution. And where necessary, appropriate mutual legal assistance, in my view, need to be formalized through treaties between countries. Because if you have informal uh, arrangements, it is not going to work unless uh, you have something drafted to formalize those arrangements. And that can create a solid basis for international cooperation. Finally, I just want to mention um, another reason for there to be poor implementation can be due to the fact that there is no strong and independent prosecutorial body in place. To be able to effectively counter transnational organized crime, every country has got to ensure that its prosecutorial body enjoys full independence. In a number of countries, this is ensured by entrenching the powers of the DPP, for example, in no less than the constitution itself. And at the same time, with a, a strong prosecutorial service, you also need a transparent, robust and independent judicial system. Magistrates and judges must be adequately trained to deal with sophisticated organized crime cases. Governments need to ensure that sufficient funds and resources are allocated to the judiciary for that purpose. And uh, all of that are mechanisms through which we can ensure that uh, transnational crime are best tackled and how the gaps can be minimized between having a system in place and ensuring that it works. Thank you so much, Dia, for that answer um, that went into several different um, important elements, um, mutual legal assistance among them, um, in terms of, of how we start filling that implementation gap um, in different countries um, that may be represented here today. Let me um, move on to my third question for you, um, which is about your country, Mauritius, and, and its experience in this domain of countering transnational organized crime. So Mauritius has experiences prosecuting and convicting pirates in the Indian Ocean region. Um, so based on that, 
Can you reflect on the importance of legal commitments along with different governments' political will in fostering that kind of cross-border collaboration between African states to stop organized criminals? Thank you, Catherine. I'm very pleased to be uh, giving the example of, of what happened in Mauritius here to illustrate how best cross-border collaboration can work in this field. So the prosecution and trial of Somali pirates took place in Mauritius between 2013 and 2016. And as I said, it is the perfect example to show how cross-border collaboration can help to fight, in this case, it was piracy in the Indian Ocean. In a gist, 12 Somali pirates were prosecuted in Mauritius for an act of piracy which took place in January 2013 on the high seas, around 240 nautical miles off the Somali coast. And between 2013 to 2016, we had a trial, an acquittal of the 12 pirates, an appeal by the DPP to the Supreme Court, which resulted in a retrial, and finally we had a successful conviction. How did Mauritius achieve this? The answer, in my view, is through strong international cooperation, and I'm going to demonstrate how it happened. It all started off with a very strong national engagement and political will of Mauritius to combat piracy in the Indian Ocean area. In 2010, the EU and the, EU and the UNODC put up a joint program on support to the trial and related treatment of piracy suspects in Mauritius. This took the form of training that was given to police, to prosecutors, to, to, to judicial officers, um, also legislative support and support to enhance court infrastructure and uh, facilities. And more importantly, in July 2011, Mauritius signed an agreement with the EU, which allows for the transfer of suspected pirates captured by the EU now for naval mission for investigation, prosecution, trial, detention in Mauritius, and for the transfer of seized property. In fact, it is pursuant to that agreement that the Somali pirates were transferred from Somali to Mauritius for detention, prosecution, and trial. Further to that, in May 2012, the government of Mauritius also signed an agreement with Somalia for transferring convicted pirates back to Somalia for the purpose of eventually serving their sentences. And under this agreement, the United Nations agreed to pay the cost of transfers to UN-built prisons in Somalia. And subsequently, after the trial and con conviction of the 12 Somali pirates, in September 2016, they were sent back to Somalia to serve their sentence pursuant to that agreement. Therefore, those agreements acted as essential tools which facilitated the transfer of the Somali pirates, firstly for trial, investigation, prosecution, and secondly, the second agreement for the transfer back of the pirates after conviction to serve sentence. So that's one important step that took place, the formalization through agreements. Another important step which Mauritius had to take was to align and reinforce its legal regime and its legal framework. Mauritius was already a signatory of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. However, it had to strengthen its anti-piracy capabilities by adopting various relevant legislative instruments. <coughs> Excuse me. First and foremost, a new Piracy and Maritime Violence Act was passed in 2011. Excuse me. It was premised on the national dimension of modern day piracy and on the principle of universal jurisdiction to counter it. That new law also introduced the possibility for the holding of video link testimonies and the admission of evidence in written form where the presence of a witness, for instance, a seafarer, cannot be secured. <coughs> in addition to the Piracy Act, Mauritius also adopted laws concerning assets recovery in 2011, and it had to amend its existing law on mutual assistance in criminal matters <coughs> in order to foster <coughs> cooperation with foreign governments to tackle pirates. Finally, Catherine, much emphasis was placed on training and capacity building in Mauritius. So since signing the transfer agreements, Mauritius began actively training the police, judges, lawyers to handle anti-piracy cases. And many of these trainings were facilitated by international partners such as EU, Interpol, UNODC. So I hope through this example that I have been able to demonstrate how international legal commitment was translated at national level and how through strong political will 
and effective cross-border collaboration, the desired results were achieved. Thank you very much, Dia, for sharing that experience from your country um, and from the Indian Ocean region. Um, now, I will switch languages. I think now we have uh, no, we have overcome the connection problems with Madame Gazibo, who will join us now. Hello. So I want to ask you a question, Madame Gazibo. Can you explain to us why strategies and pol national policies? to counter transnational organized crime are important elements of building African states' resilience to these threats. You have seven minutes to answer this question. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with you today. Sorry for my poor connection. In terms of the fight against Afri uh, human trafficking, we have uh, many African states uh, feel that this is a fight that does not concern us. M many African states must say we must domesticate these concerns. It is so important what I have learned from my personal experience that human trafficking, human struggling, um, African states must, they have made a choice, in fact, they must, they must choose a ministry that will deal with these issues. And it must be all elements of the administration that is aware of this. The first thing we must do is to convince ourselves that we must, that these practices exist on our lands and they endanger our citizens. And we have to make the choice to create key institutions that will touch upon all the ministries, Ministry of the Interior, of Justice, all of them. We need to put in place strategies, conceive and implement strategies. And so we have to have an international commission to that will include the totality of these issues. We have to have the uh, dealing with civil society, media, government, because we feel that this is something that is global and everybody must be a part of it. When the commission was created, we also created an agency to implement all of these policies and strategies that are important and that were put in place by the government. And this is what we call an action plan. This is what really helped us move forward. The government adopted this as well as the judicial aspect. We included national and international actors, the Minister of Interior, the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Defense, all of the others, education, and also the Un uh, European Union in the case of countering uh, international crime. All of our partners have been included so that the globality of our actions follow our decision. And I think that this has made all the difference. And all of the, um, all of the legal system has been included. And we also want to speak to religious leaders and to all persons. And we want to domesticate these, um, these international accords. When you have a strategy, when you have a policy that has been validated, 
it creates administrative legitimacy so you can tell all the actors it is not what i want it is what the state of nigeria wants it's what the government wants and that way the partners who we work with understand because otherwise if you don't have the policy if you don't have documents if you just say i want to implement uh this uh, awareness, it won't work with our partners. But if you have a national document that says that Niger is going to put into place certain policies, that it will include the judges, then you have legitimacy and our partners will support us. And we have a round table to present the documents and the strategy of Niger. All of our partners said yes to this because they felt that this was important, that, us, that the strategies that the state had proposed were coherent, and therefore they were willing to support us. So it's our document that we uh, rested upon and that we put in action. So we have to, this is a daily fight that we have to, it's a continuous fight there are the questions in initially it's you have to accept this internally and you have to understand how these issues touch upon our own countrymen and oftentimes people are not even willing to admit these facts of human trafficking but I know it's been four or five years we have been working on this, but we still don't have the necessary institutions in place. We are still getting to that point to get everybody to understand we have to legislate and criminalize these actions. So we have to have a, a legal basis to implement these these actions today there are only four african countries that have these structures in place nigeria has done it and the results have been amazing everybody agrees that human trafficking has been greatly touched by these actions they have positive reactions in and we are able in Nigeria as well, um, we are working on this and, and we are helping to prevent the, um, this trafficking. And also Ivory Coast has understand you need institutions and at the head of which you have to have leaders. And so Ivory Coast has an agency now, fairly recently, that has indicated you have to have a permanent department to prevent these activities. You have to have awareness programs. You have to let, uh, you have to have programs for the gendarmerie to be able to respond to the problems of trafficking and smuggling. And, and in Benin also, they are speaking of the necessity of creating institutions, institutions that will implement these policies to counter human trafficking and smuggling. And what do we need to uh, put in place? Um, it is necessary to, one department alone cannot implement this. We need to have institutions at the level of the state and the government, but also we need partners. And the partners will be willing to help the governments when they know that they are not wasting their money. But if the partners see that the government is serious because the government, the state is, is looking at the complexities of the issues, then partners are encourage to put in place structures that will support these efforts so so 
globally, it is so important for states to have strategies, to have policies, to have in context to fight these, uh, to counter these issues and to have synergy. If you are an institution, you can speak to everyone. If you are all of the steps that are taken, there is a, a model to follow a, to start with. You have to have institutions in place. It is important that the policies and strategies of, are based on this. Thank you so much, Madame Gazibou, for your answer to this question. There are many uh, examples in West Africa as well. Let me ask you a small question for a few minutes. What are the aspects of a uh, legal and policy framework have helped you to promote the coordination at the ministerial level and inter-organization levels? To begin with, from the, on from the onset of from 2010, Nigeria is part of a group of countries that was denying the existence of human trafficking and smuggling um we did not want to admit that uh, toc was a reality what the state did was to give to give different organizations the obligation to work together and in nigeria they said that all of the structures needed to coordinate their interventions and this is what brought us to where we are today and to have agreements, protocols and agreements. If Niger has experience to share in the fight against uh, this trafficking, we have opted for two things. First of all, at the level of government structures, we have a memorandum in place from the Ministry of Interior and the police and for the Gendarmerie the International Agency for the Commission for Justice and the actors of civil society, we share our information with all these entities to make aware all these entities of the issues. When we have these awareness campaigns, all the actors will understand one of the important innovations of Nigeria is when we understand that this is a global holistic situation in terms of uh, the criminal, criminal justice, the procedures for criminal justice, we realized very quickly that the, um, that the the Justice Department was not, the attorneys were not properly trained, the prosecutors were not properly trained. So we had to correct this. So we had to make sure that everyone, the police, the gendarmerie, the prosecutors, everyone had a comparable training. So we get together twice a year, all of these different actors come together twice a year to see what is working, what is not working, often the police will say the procedures are, 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 are not well undertaken or the investigations are not well undertaken. So the prosecutors can say, well, here are the proofs, here's the evidence. This is, this is why we were unable to, um, to uh, prosecute such and such a person. This is what was missing. And so everyone, the lawyers, the judges, the police, very often we are not on the same page. So we are fighting against this as well. Civil society has assisted us as well. We have to prevent uh, and we have to protect these criminal acts. And we have to, you must have a proper legal response 
but you have to have means to prosecute the criminals. And this is what has brought us to this point where we have signed treaties with partners, all of the partners that are in Nigeria. And we have, therefore, uh, protocols in place with CTM to make the difference between the victims of human trafficking um, and, and the victims of human smuggling. And almost all of the NGOs who are supporting us say we have to coordinate all our efforts and, with our uh, technical partners. So we said, here is the program of Nigeria. So we, if a project is working, is not working, we're not going to spend more money on it. But if it is working, we shall. So we want to distribute the efforts to not put too much money in repetitive actions. And we are part of uh, a number of countries working on this. One of the best strategies for an African country to counter trafficking is to take it's is to take the look at these problems holistically. So we also have trained uh, media um, actors and journalists as well. It is our responsibility to make to work together, and we started with uh, studios, uh, every agent, agency has has worked to awaken the awareness of the entire media community and our, the, the, we included um, on the themes the ensemble of teams and, pro and judicial procedures on each element of the human trafficking had three hearings because everybody is speaking about this topic. So when we don't have the means for uh, uh, creating an awareness in all the actors, it, it's a problem. But I think that today we have a coordination with our memorandum that uh, with the gendarmerie, with the police, uh, with justice, that we do have coordination in place now. It's not perfect, but really we've had very good results uh, with this. Thank you so much, Madam Gazibout, for having uh, explained all this to us. One other question, please, before we go to questions and answers. Can you briefly reflect on the role of political leadership and political will in countering organized crime in Africa? What steps can African security and justice officials take to build political will and citizen enthusiasm? This is so important. The first example of Niger until 2010 when the uh, politicians, the policy said at the time that there was not a problem of human trafficking before 2010. And so at the, to be able to domesticate the protocols and the international conventions, the authorities must first accept these realities. From my personal experience in each state, as in Niger, well, Niger was the first country to have a commission. We have supported several countries. I, I helped the Ivory Coast, uh, Mali, uh, Mauritania, Morocco, Senegal, Ivory Coast. Each time that I have participated, when the uh, government received me, I developed more awareness of the problems. But the, the it's it's the countries that invited me, the technicians. But but oftentimes the politicians did not speak with me. So in Mali, for example, the uh, with the uh, political instability. Uh, that's a problem. 
uh, Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, I went to Côte d'Ivoire and three months later the project was in place. In Benin it was the same thing. In Benin the uh, Embassy of the United States asked me to go there actually and uh, to show how certain aspects uh, worked for us and other aspects did not. And it's the Ministry of Financing who uh, then decided to jump on board and we discussed with them in the following months and they really have uh, adopted measures. And when the president of the Republic of Nigeria speaks to the country. He congratulated the institutions that are fighting against human trafficking and smuggling to support the um, human rights because these institutions are doing such good work. The government was recognizing it, recognizing their actions. And so the uh, financial assistance that the state can bring is very limited, but it also gives in, um, a, a, a desire and enthusiasm to our partners to support the state in their efforts and to encourage institutions to uh, follow in these steps. And this way, there, we have never dealt with slavery until the Ministry of Justice told the um, Justice Department to to prosecute these situations. And then we saw a real change. So in terms of these strategies, I saw the difference between Mali, the Senegal, Nigeria. It's important to have political will. This is indispensable. It is absolutely necessary. No matter what decrees you have, if you do not have the support of the of political will, then um, your efforts will um, be subverted. Political will is absolutely necessary. Thank you so much. Thank you to both of our presenters for um, really wonderful answers to these difficult questions. We will now turn to our audience. I will um, read off some questions that um, the alumni in the audience have been asking during both of your presentations, and we will spend the next 20 minutes or so um, getting you to respond to some of those. Um, to remind our audience, as we move into the Q&A session, um, we will continue to record the meeting. I urge you to type your questions into the Zoom chat so that our panelists can answer them. Um, and I will do my best to fit in as many as I can. Okay, let me start. Um, I will ask three questions and then I will turn to each of the panelists for answers to whichever of those questions uh, they would like to address. So one question um, that is, Specific to Dia, I believe, somebody asks, how many pirates has Mauritius judged as a result of collaboration with the EU and the UNODC? So um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Um, a second question, um, what is going on with customs enforcement in Niger? What is the level of cooperation between judiciary and customs? <coughs> Um, in relation to, I, I believe, um, countering transnational organized crime generally, but also in um, countering human trafficking specifically. Um, and a third question for both of you, perhaps, um, with regards to uh, capacity building, governments may need to reconsider the posting of trained personnel to schedules not related to the areas they have received several trainings on. This is usually the case for prosecutors, law enforcement, and investigators when there is a change of government in some countries. So do either of you have a response to that comment or experiences with those kinds of transitions and, and keeping some sort of continuity? I'll start with those and we will try to do at least one more round 
Um, could each of you spend maybe two or three minutes responding to what you would like? Uh, let us start with Gia this time. Thank you, Catherine. <clears throat> that first question that was addressed to me, well, the simple answer is we've had only one trial in Mauritius. And so we've only tried 12 pirates. And I'll have a go at the last question that you uh, pointed out. I think that's a very good point that uh, the participant makes, that very often we train a pool of people and those people tend to be transferred to other departments. It's something quite systemic in certain jurisdictions where in Mauritius itself, for example, those who are at the Attorney General's office end up becoming judges of the Supreme Court. So I may be a trained lawyer, for example, in maritime law, but eventually when I move up the ladder, I could end up being posted to the judiciary. But uh, the answer could probably be, because sometimes you cannot change an existing system, you need to ensure that it is not the same people who are trained all the time. This is why I think one of the ways is to ensure that you have new pools of people. When there are new people joining the service, whether it be uh, law enforcement officials or even lawyers, we need to ensure that within one office, it's not one person who's trained in a certain area, that it is a pool of persons, precisely to ensure that there is, you know, la continuité. So uh, this is probably one of the ways in which that can be addressed. But yes, I'm aware that uh, this is a problem that exists, but unfortunately it's systemic. Thank you, Dita, for those answers. Madame Gazebo, would you like to take your turn at answering any or all of those three questions? I would like to first answer uh, the first question, which has to do with the judiciary. And what I was telling you is that uh, first you have to understand the role of the different actors. For example, we have 10 tribunals of high instance in Niger. And we have for each of them a magistrate. And the magistrate is dealing with all the cases of that geographic, in that geographical zone. It is always the same magistrate who is on the case of the same case. And then when the case comes before the court, it is this magistrate who is going to be in charge of the follow-up. Whatever needs to be done, he is in charge. And then when it comes to the decision, it is the same magistrate who is going to take the decision. The Ministry of Interior does the same thing with the police forces. Uh, the police agents are trained. They are the representatives of that police station. They are only responsible of the police work in that geographical zone. So the procedure uh, is put in place and uh, you have to understand that everybody has a speciality. Um, so in every geographical zone, uh, you have the policeman who is a specialist, you have the magistrate who is a specialist. And once we had that in place, that really helped us also with the convictions because whatever the penalties were, whatever um, the sentencing was, it was easier to put in place since we had the specialties. It is important that you have the actors of the criminal chain work together and that they know what their role to play is, but also that they know how to collaborate with each other. It's very important. It was so uh, difficult before we had this in place, but now we have better results. I mean, I won't say that the results are sufficient. Um, there is still uh, always a space for improvement, but definitely there was lots of improvement. In 2013, we started uh, with uh, this action plan because we looked up the national statistics and we needed to do something because we have now 
in uh, 2020, not only three cases pending, like it was in 2013, the case, but we have 200 cases on file. And it is because we have more specialists. In every region, the three work together and they got the training. So we needed this decentralization from the capital so that we could train um, the officers. The first question was for Dia, and, but the third question, I was not able to hear that question. I didn't understand it. I can repeat that for you, Madame Gadibo. Let me look here. Um, I believe it was about customs, the customs agency in Niger specifically, and how customs fits in with this broader infrastructure of cooperation and dealing with organized crime. Do you have any comments on that? When you take the ordinance of December 2016 with regards to Niger, well, we have three focal points within the agency. We have customs, gendarmerie, and police forces. And uh, the members of the commission they reflected on plans and strategies and strategies and we train all these actors just like for the gendarmerie and the police form, uh, forces uh, we also train the people who work in customs so that they can work together with uh, law enforcement on every level and well i admit that we have to put more efforts into the training uh, of the customs officers because we did not give them as much training as uh, to law enforcement. Um, but police officers, uh, because they work directly um, on the ground, we gave them first training. But I understand that we have to enlarge this because we, uh, well, even though we have uh, this text in our laws, uh, customs does not fill uh, their uh, position as, as, as much as uh, the other actors in the playing field. Thank you. Thank you for those answers um, to both of you. Let's do another round of questions. I will ask another three um, that we're getting from the participants with us. One is, one is the following. Um, from South Africa. I am impressed by the legal systems that Mauritius put in place by entering into treaties with other multilateral organizations and Somalia. With the latter, does the treaty also include issues of repeat offenders and rehabilitation? What guarantees do we have that once extradited, the pirates do in fact serve their terms? Question number two. Uh, is for Madame Gazibo from um, a, a compatriot in Nigeria. Um, to what extent has Niger aligned its national legislation with the Palermo Convention, especially as relating to the criminalization of trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants in the TOC supplementary protocols? Um, if you could maybe explain what a supplementary protocol to the Palermo Convention is for some people in our audience and then answer the question about whether Niger has aligned, that would be great. Um, and let me take um, one more coming from Lusutu. Uh, Dia alluded to Africa having low resilience to threats. This is evident in the African Union failure to achieve silencing the guns by 2020, as set in 2013. I find the effort to combat transnational organized crime facing the same challenges. Can you convince us to the contrary? And what can be done to avert such failure? I think that is a question for both uh, Ms. Bison Doyle and Madame Gazebo. <clears throat> Let me turn back to Dia first for your, your responses and reactions. Yes, thank you, Catherine. Um, the first question was in relation to the agreement on transfer of prisoners. 
Now, uh, I'm not privy to, ex to the exact clauses of that agreement, but uh, normally the transfer of prisoners agreement will set out the mode and the method of the transfer of those prisoners back to their country. So it will be on ad administra administrative arrangements in place. And I do not think that such an agreement would contain anything about rehabilitation because the court which has sentenced it, for example, Mauritius having sentenced the pirates will already have looked into issues like the previous convictions of those pirates. It will take into account the criminal uh, history before it uh, gives the sentence. So the question of repeat offenders, I'm not too sure that will be covered in the transfer agreement. Now, the question that was asked, what guarantee do we have that once we send them back that they will be made to serve uh, their actual sentence? Um, we don't have a guarantee, that is the answer. Um, I can give an example of, of, of something which happened very recently. Um, it was to do with, with Seychelles. Um, Seychelles had um, successfully prosecuted, convicted, and eventually transferred prisoners back to Somalia. But unfortunately, it was informed, it was informed later on, it learned actually through the press that some of the convicts had benefited from an early release and Seychelles immediately contacted um, the authorities in Somali and also contacted um, the uh, Indian Ocean Commission, uh, the chair being Mauritius, and jointly uh, they wrote to the UN Security Council to inform about that because it was a clear breach of the transfer agreement. So that is the only thing that you can unfortunately do because the pirates are there in, in the country to which they have been sent. So at most, what you can do is to draw attention to the breach of the agreement and then try to seize international um, organizations and instances to, to, to bring those breach to the attention. Um, this is what happened in the case of, 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 of the Seychelles recently. The question from Lesotho. I believe I did answer that in part of my uh, answers when I spoke about what we can do to minimize the gap. So I am not too sure whether there was anything more specific that, that required me answering. Yes, I guess part of the message is that it's a lot of hard work across many, yes. a long time and across many yes. sectors, right, um, in order to yes work hard to bridge that gap and hope that exactly exactly it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very big challenge and Catherine and um, can I just comment on one of the um, one of the things that I saw was put in the in the chat I think uh, one or two participants observed that um, we, are, we are probably laying a lot of emphasis on the legal side on the judicial side um, probably not enough on uh, the role of, of investigators and I here want to stress I want to lay emphasis Investigators are key because it is only when investigators are trained adequately, they do their job properly, there's a proper policing in place. This is the starting point. If that point we mess up, we cannot move on to the next part, which is prosecution and then the, the trial in court. So I want to just lay emphasis on the fact that uh, it does not mean that that the investigation side is not contributing. In fact, those law enforcement officials who are involved in the fight against transnational organized crime, be it police officers, be it members of the Coast Guard when it concerns maritime offenses. They are key individuals in the fight against transnational organized crime. And we need to keep stressing, I think it's not enough to, 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 to just say it, but we need to stress on the need to train these people because they are the people on the ground who face these problems. And without them, the chain will not reach to prosecution and conviction. Thank you for adding that. Yes, there were quite a few um, comments about gendarmerie, um, law enforcement and investigation on the chat. So thank you for bringing that in. The criminal justice chain has to work together on all of these things for there to be a response in that domain. Uh, Madame Gazebo, uh, is there anything you would like to add in terms of answers to the questions in this round? Oh. Yes, and there was one question which was asked and if we specialize the police officers, it's also important 
important to specialize the gendarmerie officers. Uh, it's a chain and it is important that all the actors are well trained. I remember that in the beginning we had lots of training for the investigators, but not enough uh, for the prosecuting attorneys. The prosecuting attorneys did not get what the police officer tried to convey to him. And very, very, very fast, we understood that we also had to train the prosecutors. Um, this is something we learned. And at a certain point in time, we trained the three actors, police forces, gendarmerie, and prosecutors. And then we saw that lots of dismissals took place or the convictions were not handled appropriately. And we saw that the prosecutors were not trained the way we wanted them to um, be trained. So we didn't understand what was going on. We didn't know why we had these feeble convictions. And then we saw that we cannot get a good result if we only have uh, two actors in the chain which are, who are well trained and the third did not get enough training. And so we cannot minimize anyone. It is very important uh, to train the magistrates, the prosecutors, we also need to work with the media. We train the civil society, everybody in a systematic uh, way so that nobody is left behind. That's important. And other question was asked of me with the protocols. Uh, and with the nationalizations, the domestication. Yes, we ratified all of the conventions. Um, also uh, the conventions and the articles with regards to the migrants. Niger was the first country um, that ratified uh, the, uh, the, the law of 2016. And we work together with Côte d'Ivoire and with the neighboring country. For example, uh, for Côte d'Ivoire, um, they didn't, they had not adopted this law um, when we already had it in 2016. So we nationalized, we integrated uh, that law. And uh, that was important for us uh, for the convictions for the criminal clauses. It is very important when you work uh, on a TOC that you nationalize those laws because otherwise the convention um, does not help. The convention defines uh, the articles, but it is only when you translate the international conventions into local law that you can act. Um, with regards to human trafficking and smuggling in Niger, we saw so that there were lots of feeble points during the first years where we were working on this. The law was not formulated well. Uh, for example, uh, there was a misdemeanor and there was a crime, um, which was the conviction uh, for human trafficking. And so we had to do something. We had to, we had to have a protocol. We did not have a protocol and uh, the protocols, they were not nationalized yet in our portfolio.